My name is Femi Omotayo. I am the lead pastor of this congregation, and I'm really glad that you could make it here this morning. And for the folks at home, um, wake up. Uh, this morning, I want us to take a look at the journey of the Israelites uh, from Egypt to the Promised Land, because their journey or their experience is symbolic of the life of a believer today. It is a type and it is an example for us. Amen? Uh, specifically to learn from. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. What the Bible is telling us is that the Old Testament or the journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land was specifically written for you and I. Amen? Their life is an example of our life. Of course, the times are different. Amen? But the Bible is specifically, and I keep using the word specifically so that you understand that these things are speaking to you. These things are written for you. Amen? And so even though the times are different, we have so much to learn from looking at their lives. And that is my goal this morning, to teach us something from their life. Amen? So let's read the book of Exodus chapter 17. I'll read from verses 1 to 7. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. Don't you remember say Rephidim? But there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Then the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. In verse 6, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Masaha and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? These guys were, were thirsty, right? They had been walking around in the desert and their water supplies had run out, yeah? And the Bible says that they got upset and they started to complain and they started to quarrel, amen? They started to get mad at Moses, they started to quarrel with Moses. And Moses goes to God and God solves the problem by saying to Moses, take the staff with which you struck the Nile and hit the rock, strike the rock, the Bible says, at a place called Horeb. God said, I will be standing by that rock. I'll be standing by the rock. Strike the rock. And the Bible says, Moses struck the rock. And water came out of the rock. Now, this was not the first time, yeah, that the Israelites had gotten into a difficult situation. And the staff of Moses had, uh, 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 the, the staff that Moses carried became the solution to their problems. If you look back to when Pharaoh thought he had trapped them in front of the Red Sea, it was that same staff that God said to Moses, stretch it out over the Red Sea. And the Bible says, when he stretched it out, the waters parted, yeah? And the Israelites passed through on dry land. Then God asked him to stretch the staff again over the Red Sea, and the waters came back together and drowned the, uh, the Egyptian army in it. It was the same staff that he stretched over all the waters of Egypt and they turned into blood. God had actually done a lot of miracles with this staff. You know, the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 4 verse 17, and you shall take this rod, this staff in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. So that staff was God's instrument of signs and wonders, amen. He would perform many miracles with that staff. And it's interesting that 
it was just a simple staff, a simple rod, something he used to, uh, to walk, to give himself support, something he used to defend his uh, sheep from wild animals when he was a shepherd. But he was an instrument of God's power. Amen? Now, as we go deeper into their journey from Egypt to the promised land, right, something changes. In Numbers chapter 20, let's read it. It's a long reading, but I want to show you something. It says in, from verse 2, it says, Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses again and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? It's like these guys are like a broken record. They, they keep saying the same things. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain, it has no figs, no grapevines, no pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. And then Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting, and they fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, take the staff, don't you remember and say the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as the Lord commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock just as the Lord commanded him. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. Turn to your neighbor and say, you rebel. Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with his staff and water gushed out. And the community and their livestock, they drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough, to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. So, same scenario as number 17. Now, number 17, sorry, Exodus 17 happened as they were coming out of Egypt. Numbers 20 happened just before they entered the promised land or just towards the tail end, close to the promised land. Same scenario, different place, different time. The first incident right, occurred at a place called Horeb, in an area known as Rephidim. This happened before God gave them the Ten Commandments or the laws. Don't you know what I say before? So, the folks are thirsty, right? And they get upset again. Moses goes to God again. For Moses, this has become routine. Yeah? They complain. He goes to God. And God tells him to take his staff again. The same staff and go to the rock. But instead of striking the rock, the Lord asks Moses specifically to speak to the rock and the rock will pour out water. But Moses, Uncle Moses, rather than speaking to the rock, he struck the rock twice. Amen? And guess what happened? Water gushed out of the rock. But God was livid. It was that singular act, yeah, which cost, cost Moses the promised land. God asked him to speak to the rock, but instead he struck the rock and God punished him. And why did he strike the rock? He did not believe. God said, you did not believe me. You did not trust me. He did not believe that speaking to the rock would work. Moses was used to signs and wonders being performed through the rod, through the staff. When God switched it and said, speak, he clung to what he knew. So instead of trusting God and doing what God said, he thought to himself, you know what? This has always worked, so this is what I am going to do. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. God said, you did not believe me. Can you imagine getting a word from God? 
are not believing. And Moses, he knew the voice of God. So in Moses' mind, there was no controversy. This was God. But he said, you know what? I'm going to do it my way. I think from my experience, it was easier to wrap his own mind around the idea that striking the rock would bring forth water. But wrapping his mind around the thought that speaking to the rock, he, it, it didn't make sense. It did not fit. It was not the natural order of things. This is not the sequence he was used to. And that inability to, to suspend his own understanding and experience and depend on the word of God, that unwillingness to speak to a rock made God punish him. And it cost him the promised land. The whole essence, the, the one goal of his life, take these people from Egypt, take them to the promised land. Because he did not trust God, he did not fulfill his destiny. When he was confronted with a challenge, it was easier for him to do than to believe. It was easier for him to take action than to have faith. But God did not call him in that situation to do. God called him to believe and to speak. You know, it is very interesting to me that we see the same problem. No water. Two different days. Amen? Two different times. Two separate instructions. Two different places. And two different reactions from God. At Horeb, God said, strike the rock. I will be there. At Kadesh, God says, speak to the rock. And the rock will perform. I'm not sure if we know this, but Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. And if you study the Bible, you know that it was at Mount Sinai that God gave Moses the laws for Israel. The Ten Commandments were given at Sinai. Now, this incident of no water happened before the laws were given. Amen? But it was where the laws were given that they struck the rock. Yeah? Now, at Kadesh, Kadesh was after the Ten Commandments had been given. So Horeb was before the Ten Commandments. Kadesh was after the Ten Commandments. And when I say Ten Commandments, I'm talking about 613 laws. Yeah? I want you guys to always remember that number, 613. Don't you remember say 613? So before 613 laws, they were at Horeb. Right? Everybody say Horeb. At home, please say Horeb. Then God gave them the laws. Then they came to Kadesh. So between Horeb and Kadesh were the laws. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. After the Ten Commandments had been given, it was after the Ten Commandments had been given, at Kadesh, the same thing happened, sorry, at Kadesh, the, um, they were thirsty and God said, speak to the rock. But also at Kadesh, at a different time, that was the same place where Moses sent out the 12 spies to go and spy out the land of Canaan. And 10 of them came back with an evil report. They said, we are, they said the land is flowing with milk and honey. It's great. But we saw the inhabitants of the land and they were giants. In fact, we were like grasshoppers before them. The Bible says they came with an evil report. And the rest of Israel supported their version. And what did God do? He punished them. He punished the 10 spies. Yeah? And the remaining, everybody who believed their reports, he punished them. Only two people escaped that punishment. Joshua and Caleb. Yeah? And the reason why Joshua and Caleb escaped was because they believed. Everyone else, and when I say God punished them, I want us to be clear. They did not enter the promised land. They died before they got to the promised land. You know how God did it? 
he kept them in the wilderness for 40 years, wandering around in circles until every single one of them died. If anybody had lived to 41 after that, they would have been there for 41 years. But none of those guys were going to enter the promised land. It seems to me that Horeb is the place of work and law. But Kadesh is the place of faith. It's the place where God expects a man to trust him, to trust his word, and to do it the way that he said it. Every time God called them to walk in faith, they failed. And they were punished. Amen? Because they did not have faith, Moses Moses, Moses, the one that God appeared to in a burning bush, the one who worked all these miracles, he didn't enter the promised land. Everybody who came out of Egypt, except Joshua and Caleb, didn't enter the promised land. All of them died. All of them. You know the interesting thing about Joshua and Caleb? Joshua and Caleb saw the same things as the other ten spies. They did not dispute that the giants or the men were giants. They didn't say, no, now, come on. They were only six feet tall. They didn't argue. They said, yes, you're right. But our God is bigger than these. And that was the difference. They chose to have faith in God instead of trembling in fear. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 21. Somebody said, uh, P.F., you read a lot of scriptures when you preach. Can't you just take one sermon, one, one, one verse of scripture? And the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the truth is established. You see, and that's why we get into trouble. Somebody will take one line of scripture and build a castle of, on sand. And we get led astray. I told you, sir, of the man who came to my church and took one sentence. God will make you an amazement and a wonder. And he scattered the church. They were so excited. That was the day I knew that I had not been doing a good job. You have not come, Hebrews 12, verse 8. He says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire. To darkness to gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. The mount that... Is being spoken of in the book of Hebrews is Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. You see, one of the things I just want to point out to us is that before the Israelites received the Ten Commandments, they lived by grace. And God was extremely lenient with them. But once they received the Ten Commandments, judgment followed. The Bible says, without the law, there is no sin. And once they received the law, sin became part of the conversation and God judges sin. In fact, let me tell you something. When God said he was going to give them the Ten Commandments, you know what they said? Please bring it. We will do it. We will do all. We promise we will do it. We will keep the word and God gave it to them. Do you know what happened? As soon as they received the Ten Commandments, what was the first thing that this brothers did. They built a golden calf. And the very first law, before number two came, once the first law was written, sin entered and that law was the law they broke. By the time Moses came down from the mountain, they were already fully. The place was lit. They were having the jolly of jollies. A good time like you can't even imagine. They were partying, drinking, 
Oh, jeez. They, they just went mad. It was wild. On that night, 3,000 people. God killed 3,000 people that night. 3,000 people. He was so, he was just like, really? Poof. And 3,000 people died. But you know the interesting thing? On the day that the Holy Spirit was given, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. The Bible says that the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. On the day they received the letter, 3,000 people died. On the day they received the Spirit, 3,000 people were saved. Which one do you want? The letter or the Spirit? I, I personally, I, I vote for the Spirit. As for me and my family, Spirit. My, my brothers and sisters, we are in a dispensation where we are called not to strike rocks, but to speak to our rocks. In Mark chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus Christ says, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain, it will move. In, in our generation, it is our words that have power, not staffs. Our words are the vehicles of God's power. In the days of Moses, it was a staff. Yeah? In our days, it's the words that we speak. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto what righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart you believe. You know that means with the heart you have faith. And your faith brings you into righteousness. Let's call righteousness right standing with God. So with the heart, you move from being a sinner, right? You move from being the enemy of God into a position of right standing with God. And that is where many of us are. But it was with our mouths that we receive salvation. Please, let us be clear. When the Bible is talking about salvation here, it is not talking about heaven. It is talking about salvation as the people who wrote English understand the word salvation. It is a comprehensive word. It is pronounced soterion in the Greek. It is loaded with meaning and it can be interpreted as deliverance. It can be interpreted as breakthrough. It can be interpreted as miracle. Whatever challenge you are in, a salvation is a bringing you out of that challenge. So the Bible says that with your heart you believe and your belief puts you in right standing with God. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and God declared him righteous. So to be righteous, all you have to do is believe. But to be delivered, you have to confess. So the Bible says that with the heart we believe unto righteousness. But with our mouths, we confess unto salvation. And many of us are stuck in righteousness. And we desire salvation. But some of us have decided to go and bring out our old staff as the road to our salvation. When Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and storms came and started to toss the boat around. Have you ever been on a boat in the middle of a storm? I have been on a boat and it was not a storm. It was just mildly windy. Mildly. And I can tell you this. Modern boats with technology behind it. Man, I called my ancestors. Then I didn't know Christ. I felt like I was drunk and I was not drunk. But this is a storm. And it is tossing the boat around. And what did Jesus Christ do? He spoke to the storm. He said, Peace be still. And the storm, nature, responded. When the fig tree was acting like it had fruit, what did Jesus Christ do? He spoke to the thing and it died. 
When we are faced with a challenge, my brothers and sisters, do we strike the rock? Do we go back to the old covenant? Oh, what, what do I need to do? What am I doing wrong? Is it a sin? Is it my sin? Is it my father's sin? Is it my ancestor's sin? Okay, do you know what? I'm going to behave myself going forward. So we start the year with all of these dreams and all of these visions that we want to achieve. But many of us, we start that year not saying to God, increase my faith. We start that year with the things that we do better. Because we believe that deliverance lays in the things that you do better. You're trying to get a job and you're struggling. You've been interviewing. Maybe I should stop drinking. That I think if I stop drinking, God will hear my prayers. How will God even, I'm, I keep drinking and I want God to hear my prayers. That's how we think. If I stop this, if I stop that, God will hear me. You don't understand. You can stop until you are not breathing. Bible says all your righteousness is as a filthy rag before God. The only righteousness that is acceptable to God is the one that he gives you. When you start to think like that, what do I need to stop? Or what do I need to add? I need to pray more so that God can bless me more. Is that what we think? Is that the dispensation that we are under? Absolutely not. Am I saying, go ahead and sin? That's not what I'm saying. But the Bible says, by the works of the law shall no man be justified. And what we think is that if we are justified, we will be blessed. Yeah? And how do we become justified? The Bible says, with the heart we believe. With the heart we believe. We need to stop going back to the old covenant. Trying to receive from God <laughs> through the keeping of rules and regulations. We need to stop going back to a confidence that is based on how well we have performed. We need to move to a place where we speak to our rocks by declaring the words of God. When we're faced with temptation, do we speak to the rock? I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sin has no power over me. Or do we go back to thou shalt not and thou shalt? When we're faced with storms, do we speak to the storm? Peace be still. When the enemy attacks you, do you speak to the rock? Do you declare that no weapon formed against you shall prosper? And every tongue that rises up in accusation will be silenced. When the devil came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, all he did was speak to the devil. The words that he spoke brought him the victory all he did was say he didn't do anything he was too weak to even do anything if he wanted to he only said and i know that many of us listen i'm I, i'm 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 a pastor and people like to think that pastors you know like we're not very educated sometimes i i went to school i studied philosophy I think very deeply. There's nothing superficial about me, even if I say so myself. I like to think of myself as a very intelligent young man. Sorry, not young, but intelligent. <laughs> Hallelujah. By the grace of God, of course. By the grace of God. And the best education my country had to offer. <clears throat> and so, you know, the idea of speaking is ridiculous. A child is sick. Speak to that sickness. Guy, come on. Come on. You went to school now. Come on, come on, come on. I, I don't want to hear that nonsense, please. You, you are doing too much. Speak to it. That's what the word of God says. Oh, sorry. That's the same thing Moses thought. God says, speak to the rock. No contact. Maybe Moses thought that it was when he hit that rock with the rod that some volcanic forces or an earthquake, something, something happened in physics or geography to cause that rock to spew out water. He found a way to rationalize what he did and connect his actions to what God did. But when he couldn't find that connection, he faltered. 
And that's where many of us are. When we can't find a direct correction, co connection to what we have done and what we're expecting from God, we falter because we don't understand grace. Let me tell you what grace is, my brothers and sisters. Unmerited favor. Undeserved. Unearned. If you worked for it, it would not be a gift. It would be a wage. But the Bible says it is a gift so that nobody can boast. Nobody can flex. So if somebody is trying to boast to you about what they have, you need to tell them clearly you don't understand that what you have is a gift from God. So please be quiet and sit down. I know that when we speak the words of God as opposed to what we see, we can appear crazy to people who don't understand what we're doing. But it's important to remember whose child you are. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 17, it says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believes, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The King James Version, another version says, who calls those things that are not as though they are? Those things that are not as though they are. I am still struggling with sin. But I am the righteousness of God. I can call myself a sinner. That makes sense. Or I can call myself the righteousness of God. I still feel pain in my body. But the word of God says I am healed. I can say I am sick or I can say I am healed. The enemy surrounds me. I don't see a way out. I can say I am doomed or I can say that with every weapon that the enemy forms against me, there is a guarantee of failure to it. It is up to you. Whose child are you? Who is your father? He gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. He calls those things which are not. There is an acknowledgement that they are not. When God said, let there be light, it wasn't a denial of darkness. It was a creation of light. I don't need to affirm or validate the idea that I'm sick. My body's already doing it. Why should my mouth agree with my body? As opposed to agreeing with the word of God. What does it cost you? Let me tell you what it costs you. It makes you look silly. That's what it costs. That's, that's the price you pay. You look silly in front of people. That, that's why we don't do it. it. It just seems silly. It seems absurd. It seems contrived. But isn't that ridiculous, though? That the power of life and death, I don't have to leave my house to find it. I don't even have to get out of my PJs to find it. It is in my mouth. The Bible says, a man's belly shall be satisfied by the fruit of his lips. But rather than speak into existence those things which are not. You know when the Bible says, do not conform to the world, there are many, there are, there are many layers to it. Because we try so hard to fit in and to be accepted. Even though we say we don't want to go where they're going. Remember whose child you are. Remember whose child you are. Don't forget where you are coming from. You are not of this world. Even though you live in this world. We operate by different rules. And if you believe that, and you speak that, Jesus says you will start to see the changes. You will start to see things happening. But you and I, let me tell you what we do. We'll say it one time, and we don't say anything. And yeah, let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just stop smoking. Let me just stop smoking. You know, we think that the harder it is, the more likely God will bless it. Like, you know those guys that went to a, a village doctor? And uh, the village doctor said they should bring one white cow. And they said, ah, no, this one doesn't have power. Only one white cow. They went to the other one. The one said, bring one white cow and seven blue goats 
and six green chickens. They say, hey, this one is powerful. Because we, 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 we attach difficulty to power. Grace is easy. Grace is easy. And that makes it sound hard. It makes it ridiculous to us that God will, to us, God will give you everything you want just because you believe. You. Okay, you too. You want to just believe and receive. You. As if we don't know you. As if we don't know where you are coming from. Ah. That's how we think. But the Bible says that we should renew our mind. Renew your mind. You are living under a different dispensation. The words that you speak, they have power. And it's time for us to start to exercise that power. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to close here. Can you guys help me pull it up? 1 Corinthians 10. I didn't send that to you. Verses 2 to 3. It says, all of them, all of them ate the same spiritual food. And all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock. No, not the King James. Can you find the New Living Translation? Thank you. I'll read it again. It says, all of them ate the same spiritual food. And all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. My brothers and sisters, all of this comes back to Christ. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father through me. We start with Christ and we end with Christ. Everything that we need from God is contained in Christ. That is why it is critical that it is in him that we live and we move and we have our being. And I know when we say in Christ, many people struggle with that concept. But let me put it into practical terms. It is simply your confidence, your faith, your belief that Jesus died for you. And you living your life out of that place. Living your relationship with God out of that confidence. Going into the place of prayer with boldness because Jesus died for you. Speaking to the rocks because Jesus died for you. Not going back to the old. Not going back to the, uh, the laws because Jesus died for you. Walking in liberty because Jesus died for you. Ch facing your challenges you know, there's, a, there's an old hymn, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. He, operating from that place, from that mental, mental place. When something happens in your life, and the first question you ask is, what did I do to deserve this? You have stepped out of Christ. When something good happens in your life and you start to draw a line between the old lady you helped cross the road and what you just received, you have stepped out of Christ. When you are in Christ, you understand that everything that is going on in your life, good or bad, good because you are in Christ, and bad, you know it will not continue because you are in Christ. It is in him that we must live, that we must move, that we must have our being. Everything that you need is in Christ. The water that you will drink and never thirst again. It's in Christ. Let us bow our heads and pray this morning. If, if this morning you, you are here and you have never acknowledged that Jesus died for your sins, you cannot be in Christ because the door into Christ, the door into Christ is to acknowledge, is to believe 
that when he hung on the cross, he paid the price for your sins. It is that singular act of dying when you accept it that it was done for you. That is what makes you righteous. It is not coming to church. It is not not coming to church. It is believing that your sins have been paid for. Doesn't matter what they are. Doesn't matter what you've done. All your sins have been paid for. Past, present, and future. So this morning, if you have never said, I accept this offer. I'm going to put my name down. I raise my hand. I stand I receive this offer of Christ. This is a good time to do it. And this is how you do it, by repeating after me. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died for me. I thank you that his blood was shed for me. I thank you that he hung on the cross on my behalf. Father, when he died, I accept that all my sins were laid on him. All my sins were paid for with his death. Father, I turn away. I change direction. I turn away from doing life my way. I turn away from sins. I turn away from the law. And I turn to Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving your son for me. In Jesus' name we pray.